God bless you all. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. In today's time of uncertainty, bad habits have evolved. Yes, they have. We do see it in the news. The reports are so frequent that some people find these habits as normal. Well, they aren't normal. This is not what God is looking for in his children. To be part of God's kingdom, the habits, the bad habits, they must go. But the question is, how? And that is what today's message is all about. You see, bad habits range from annoying to deadly. And it was almost deadly for me. They can frustrate and discourage us. Let's see now. I'm going to tell you that there are biblical principles that can help us overcome them. Okay, let's talk about habits. So habits are patterns of behavior that are regularly and routinely repeated and often occur without any conscious thought. It has come, it has, I should say, it has become so routine in our lives that it is done subconsciously. We do not inherit these habits from our parents, but rather we learn them as we go through life. Many are learned from home. Many are learned because of activities that happen at home. They're generated. Also from earlier years in our life, we all have taken on habits. When we are a child, it might be sucking a thumb or biting fingernails. When we are older, it may be eating breakfast at a particular time each day or overspending at shops or procrastinating. These are examples of behaviors. They're not given to us. We take these habits and we take these habits as being normal. Unfortunately, if we don't know the difference between right and wrong, we'll take a, a good habit at the same time that we take a bad habit. Later in life, as we become more mature, we figure out what a bad habit is, such as smoking or alcoholism. Then we have to take action to remove that bad habit and then invoke a new habit, perhaps a good habit. So habits are a very strong influence on our lives. This is because they are consistent, frequently unconscious activities that continually influence our behavior. As a result, how effective or ineffective depends on these habits. So these habits have a control over our lives. The bad habits have a control over our lives as well as the good habits. If we are free from the bad habits, then we are free ourselves. And this is what we wanna talk about today. Now, it's not just certain people, we all have bad habits that come out of our lives. For me, it was the addiction to alcohol. God has delivered me from that and I've been redeemed. For those who attended the February 20th Bravehearted Men's Meeting in, our, uh, in the year 2020, you might remember me talking about how I nearly committed suicide multiple times. I won't talk about that here, I'll leave it uh, at that meeting. But in the years that followed, a process occurred that pulled me out of that near devastation, and now I'm much closer to the man God called me to be. And the way I became closer to the man that God called me to be is I myself got closer to God. Jeremiah 29:11 says that we all have a purpose but we need to do our part to satisfy that purpose. Now, as I said before, we can have good habits and bad habits. Some people describe themselves by listing their character traits and habits. That's how they identify who they are. Now, we should always remember that habits do not control us. Habits do not control us, but rather we control the habits. Now, when I say habits don't control us, but we seem to be succumbed to addiction, 
That's because we allow it. We need to want more to remove the habit than to keep the habit. So good habits can be learned and bad habits can be unlearned. We have to make that conscious choice. So here are some suggestions to put yourself in the driver's seat in terms of pulling away from bad habits and unlearning those bad habits and becoming the person that God has called you to be, which in turn brings you closer to God yourself. Okay, so I will talk about six steps to overcoming bad habits. Six steps. Let me first list them for you and then I will go into detail. So the first one relates to my introduction. It's to seek God's help. The next one is to make a commitment to change. That means you have to make a decision. Okay. The third one is be specific in identifying the habit to be altered. You need to know specifically what the problem is and what needs to be changed. And number four, you replace the undesirable habit with a desirable habit. See, the idea in number four, I'm going to say that again. Let me first repeat it and then I'm going to describe to you what the intent is. Number four was to replace the undesirable habit with a desirable habit. See, by removing a bad habit, then there's a void. So how do you fill that void? With a good habit. I told you before, I suffer from alcoholism. The way I got rid of that, well, there are many ways, and God led me the way. But the bad habit was alcohol that was removed. What was the good habit that came in? Well, it was during the summer that I stopped drinking. So I replaced it with salsa water. So instead of beer, it was salsa water. And I felt good that I could have a drink at a restaurant. Many people who have gone to me at a restaurant know that I might order in the summertime salsa water with a splash of pineapple. That's my specialty drink. I enjoy that and it's a healthy drink. In the winter, I like to have a hot cup of tea, black tea. Now let me tell you about number five. Have someone hold you accountable. What does that mean? Don't do it alone. Have someone say, hey, remember what you promised yourself. For me, I had my wife. She held me accountable. And number six, stay positive. Even when there are setbacks, keep moving forward. So it's all about mind control. And part of that mind control is that positive attitude. So let's talk about them. Let me talk about the first one. The first one is to seek God's help. Now, change is hard, and some essential changes can only be made with God's help. That was true for me. God knows the struggles we face, and, encourage, and he encourages us to come to him for the extra help we need. We see this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. We also see it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16. And we also see it in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 7. You see, God doesn't do all the work for us, but he does offer us the help to make us more effective. So here are the scriptures once again. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. The second one I mentioned was Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 18. And the third one was 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 7. Now I'm going to read Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. 
Ask and it will be given to you. Did you hear what I said? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. Now I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. That's Jesus. Let us then approach God's throne of grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And that's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16. And now I'll read 1st of Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Now I'm going to give you the second tip. The second tip. Number two, make a commitment to change. Remember, I told you, that's the part about making a decision. So number two is make a commitment to change. We will not start to change until we commit to change. If we don't really want to change, it simply won't happen. It's as simple as that. We may stop the habit temporarily, but it will return. We will not start to change until we commit to change. The word commit that I am saying is the part that God expects us to do. We have our part. We have an important part. For God to fulfill his promise, we have to fulfill a commitment. Let me say that again. For God to fulfill his promise, we have to fulfill a commitment. You see, it's a two-way street. That's part of the communication that God wants to have with his people who are part of his kingdom. So did you know that you can change? Believe you can change with God's help. You can do that. In Philippians 4.13, chapter 4, verse 13 of Philippians, the scripture reads, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. This includes changing to please God. If we trust our own strength, we will fail. If we try to do it alone without God's help, we will fail. Satan can defeat us. If we use Christ's strength, we will succeed because Satan can never defeat God. Perhaps we have failed in the past because we have trusted our own power instead of using God's help. See, God is there for us. He is there to help us. God never leaves us alone as long as we seek him. We have the freedom of choice to walk toward God or to walk away from God. We're not held in place. We can walk towards God or we can walk away from God. The walk is our choice. That's why it's better to walk in the faith and walk with Jesus. People sometimes convince themselves, I just can't change. It's too late. Besides, I'm only human. And all the other excuses. I know the excuses. I used to use them. See, they are not just belittling themselves as I had done. They are denying God's words. They will fail simply because they will give up instead of persisting to use God's power. Let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. God will not allow temptations 
that are beyond your ability to bear. He will always make a way of escape. That means with God, you can do it. You see, God is faithful. He will always keep his promise. It follows that you can break any bad habit and develop any good habit according to God's will. Now I'm going to go to the third tip, the third tip. The third tip is be specific in identifying the habit to be altered. Okay, we have to be specific in identifying the habit to be altered. We need to examine all the activities in our life to identify which are bad habits. You see, bad habits are anything which is seen as a negative behavior or something that's undesirable. You know what they are. It's that dark closet. Examples of bad habits are sexual immorality, smoking, excessive drinking of alcohol. That was true for me. Taking of illegal drugs, gossiping, procrastination, impatience, being critical of others, selfishness, and so forth. The list goes on. For the follower of God, bad habits are anything that turn our hearts from God and lead us to doing wrong. This is the example I was talking about of making the choice of walking away from God. But we can make a choice to walk towards God. The idea is to walk, but to make the right decision in your walk, it's to walk towards God, not away from God. Let me read Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse two through three. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse two through three. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their goals on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. And I was reading from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse two through, uh, two through three. See, God instructed the Israelites that when they took over a nation to completely destroy every pagan altar and idol in the land. So why did God want uh, everything destroyed? That's because he knew that the Israelites' beliefs could change if they started worshiping at the altars or the idols. So he didn't want anything to remain which might tempt the Israelites to worship idols. In other words, the bad habits of the conquered nations were to be completely erased so that these same habits would not pass on to the Israelites. So let's talk about bad habits. So write down a bad habit that you'd like to change. Writing it down solidifies the idea when it's fresh in your mind and a written note is a tangible tool and makes the whole process more real. Use definitive, concise language and don't be wishy-washy when wording the note. So that way you can put that bad habit on paper and hold it in your hand. Now what you do is you put the note in a place you'll find yourself usually engaging in the bad habit. That way it'll be there as a regular reminder. Now let's talk about number four, number four, this tip number four. Replace the undesirable habit with a desirable habit, okay? I talked about that before in my case. What I did was I removed the alcohol and brought in just plain seltzer water with a splash of pineapple juice. And in the winter time, black tea, hot. So I could have a nice specialty drink when I was at a restaurant. I didn't need alcohol. So number four, replace the undesirable habit with a desirable habit. See, we often remain mirrored in undesirable habits simply because we don't redirect our energy 
towards something else. A new good habit is more than a replacement for the habit we desire to break. It should be a different positive action towards which we direct our energy. So consider this advice on how to replace a bad habit. Begin by identifying the payoff your bad habit was providing relaxation, escape, reward, satisfying a hunger, or just filling time. Make sure your replacement fulfills that need as well, but in a healthy way. Number five, let me tell you about number five. Have someone hold you accountable. I told you before, in my case, it was my wife. So in Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. Again, that's Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. The scripture tells us that two people are stronger than just one because if a person falls alone, there's no one to help him up. The same is true when trying to alter life habits. We often say that we fall into bad habits. The best course of action is to have another person with us, someone who can both champion our cause and help us if we are to stumble. See, I wasn't alone. I was blessed with my wife who helped me during my difficult time with alcohol. And now I've been delivered of that and I've been redeemed. So not only does it help to have someone on your side, it also helps to have someone to celebrate the victories with you along the way. Number six, number six, tip number six, stay positive. Yes, stay positive even when there are setbacks. Life wasn't promised to be easy. There will be setbacks. But the idea is your setbacks are smaller than your steps forward. So you will achieve victory. We are often our own harshest critic. It's easy to feel so discouraged by a setback that we give up or think that we have completely failed. I understand that. Once an attitude of failure or negatively takes hold, it easy, it's so easy to completely give up. Don't, don't give up, don't quit, okay? So how long does it take to create a new habit? It's not in a minute. It's not in a day. Well, I'll tell you, the 21 day Daniel fast teaches us that. It takes three weeks. Some people might agree, some people might not, but the idea is it's not instantaneous. But I wanna to talk to you about uh, the Daniel fast, okay? Today it's June 1st of 2020 and I've already gone through two Daniel fasts uh, in, the first five months of the year 2020. And I plan to go through more because I'm changing habits. Okay, the Daniel fast is a widely utilized fast. It's based on the biblical book of Daniel. It's in the book of Daniel. It involves a 21 day elimination of animal products and preservatives and focuses on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, stuff like that. You see, the Daniel fast is based on the verses from the Bible found in Daniel chapter 10, verse 2 through 3. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. That's what the scripture says. The purpose of Christian fasting is to seek a more intimate relationship with God while ridding being totally rid of your physical body of unnatural self-gratifying food and drink. Your focus is to be one with God, not on the fleshly things of the world. So you are using God to help you rid yourself of bad habits. So during the Daniel fast, you'll want to concentrate on prayer, have that communication with God, ask for the help that you need. Also Bible study and reflection so that you understand how God speaks to us through the Bible. The Daniel fast is a great way to enter into preparation for growing in the Lord. 
you see that Daniel fast is a powerful spiritual discipline. With the coupling of fasting and prayer, one can open themselves to God's Holy Spirit. And it's also your Holy Spirit because that is the gift God gave us. Having a sincere desire to seek God, you can come to God with a contrite and repentant heart and God will minister you in a powerful, powerful way. God's awesome power is transforming and you will know that with God all things are possible. That gives you the strength to be rid of your bad habits. It's important to note that the Bible represents fasting as something that is good, profitable, and beneficial. See, the book of Acts records believers fasting before they made important decisions. That's in Acts 13.2 and Acts 14.23. So before you make important decisions, go on a fast. And fasting and prayer are often linked together. You'll see that in Luke chapter 2 verse 37 and also in Luke chapter 5 verse 33. So think about that about fasting. You'll fast before making an important decision. And understand that fasting and prayer are linked together. So let's see where we're at. What have we done today? We've talked about six steps to overcoming bad habits. That's what we've done today. Number one was to seek God's help. You're not going to be alone. You're going to seek God's help. You've got a bad habit. Don't worry. You're not alone. You're going to seek God's help. Number two, make a commitment to change. You're going to make a conscious decision that you're going to change. Number three, be specific to identify the habit that is being changed. So know specifically what it is. Write it down. Number four, just so you don't have that void, that emptiness, replace the bad habit with a good habit. Whatever that void is that would be caused by removing the bad habit, replace it with a good habit. Number five, have someone hold you accountable. Don't be alone. You've got family, you've got friends. You don't have to be alone in this fight. You also have God. Number six, stay positive even when there are setbacks. Just keep the forward motion greater than the backward motion. So, those are the six steps to overcoming bad habits. You can do it. Now you know how to do it. I thank you for joining me. My name is David Ewan and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center. Today, I think we've solved some problems and that's good. But now it's time to do your part. My name is David Ewan and this is the Resurrection Center.